So we have learned what is Hooke's law in one dimension. Now let's see how it extends to a more general case in three dimensions. The final form of the equations may look a little overwhelming. So let's add the details incrementally and see how the full picture comes together. Let's take this belt drive as an example. The driver is constantly pulling the driven on one side. And as a result, the upper part of the belt is always in a uniaxial stress state. Let's focus on a small block taken out of this belt material and see how the Hooke's law is applicable here. Say the material is stretching well within its elastic limit. If the stress developed in this block is represented by sigma xx, then according to Hooke's law, the strain developed in it is nothing but sigma xx by E. But the bell drive, as everything else in this cosmos, is in three dimensions. So there will be some strain developed in the y and z directions as well, although there are no noticeable forces acting in those directions. This is due to the Poisson's effect, which states that the materials undergo a deformation and of negative new times the strain applied in a perpendicular direction. The negative sign indicates that this deformation generally occurs in a direction opposite to actual deformation. So, if you stretch the material in one direction, it tends to compress in the other two directions. This is an attempt by the material to preserve its volume as much as it can, depending on how compressible it is. This multiplying factor is nothing but the Poisson's ratio. Now, using this relation, the strain developed in the y and z directions due to Poisson's effect is given by new, negative new times sigma xx by e. Since this is predominantly uniaxial stress state, there are no shear strains developing in it and they are set to zero. Now, let's take a slightly more complicated example. Let's look at the fabric of a trampoline or the drum head that is usually in a stretched state. Due to this preloaded state, if you take an element of material from these membranes, they are experiencing stresses in two normal directions. Therefore, they are in a state of biaxial stress. Let's use the same logic to construct the strain vector for this case. Here, the strain in x directions is influenced by both the applied stress in x direction and the Poisson strain due to the stress applied in the y direction. So, the strain epsilon xx is going to be sigma xx by e minus nu times sigma yy by e. Similarly, the strain in y direction is going to be epsilon yy equals to sigma yy by e minus nu times sigma xx by e. Since there are no stresses applied in the z direction, the only strain in z is due to the Poisson's effect, which is epsilon zz equals to negative of nu times sigma xx by e plus sigma yy by e. There are no external loads acting that can create noticeable shear strains. So we can set these terms to zero. Now, for the next case, let's look at a diver underwater. The diver experiences bion forces from all the directions. So he experiences normal stresses in all three directions. The three normal strains due to this will take these forms, like in previous cases. If we add these three strains, then we reduce the relation to this equation. Now notice that the sum of these terms is nothing but the volumetric strain. One can deduce that using simple math. Also, we can replace the sum of the three stress terms by three times the hydrostatic stress, which is nothing but the average of these components. If you carefully observe this equation, it also follows the Hooke's law. And this term is nothing but the resistance offered by the material to the change in its volume. In other words, this is the bulk modulus and this relation 
tells us how it's related to the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Before we jump into a more general case where there are all the normal and shear strains existing, let's take a moment to review something about the shear strains. Let's look at this cube that shears in the xy plane. The shear strains in the xy and y x planes are given by these terms. But the engineering shear strain is the total change in angle. So it's denoted by pi by 2 minus gamma. So gamma is nothing but the sum of the two shear strains epsilon xy and epsilon yx. But from the symmetry of strain tensor, we know that these two terms are equal. So the engineering shear strain takes this form. Note that this factor of 2 is crucial because in most common practices, the shear strain reported is the engineering strain. For this reason, in the strain vector, we tend to include this factor of 2 before the shear strains. So when someone reports to you the shear strain, do verify with them whether what they are referring to is the engineering or the true shear strains. Now let's look at this brake pad assembly. Apart from the normal stresses due to braking, shear is a major contributor to its operation, so it cannot be neglected. What we have here is a typical system where a full strain tensor is at operation. Now let's construct the strain vector for this system. Here are the normal components and here are the shear components. As you can see, they are formulated in a similar fashion as we did in earlier cases. Since we have the individual terms of strain vector, Let's rearrange them in a vector form and see what the relation looks like. This is what the strain vector for a 3D case looks like. It can be written in this linear form, fully in agreement with the Hooke's law, and this term is called as the compliance tensor. Now, as one last step, let's invert the compliance tensor and define stress as a function of strain. This is what the inverted equation looks like and this tensor is nothing but the stiffness matrix. And it can be written in a linear fashion as shown in this equation. This is what the Hooke's law relation looks like in a three-dimensional isotropic body. In the preceding section, we discussed about isotropic materials in which the material behavior is homogeneous in all the directions. However, the materials are not truly isotropic. In fact, some materials are so far from this behavior that it's not appropriate to make such an assumption. For instance, in fibrous materials, due to the presence of fibers, that are oriented in one direction, the material tends to be stiffer along the fibers direction. The Hooke's law is still applicable in such cases, but the stiffness matrix looks very different. It's important for the users to know what they are because there'll be more than one Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, and it's important to know which direction is represented by each and how they impact the stiffness matrix of the material. Orthotropic materials are a special case where the material possesses symmetry about the three orthogonal planes. In this case, the material has different Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio in each orthogonal direction which changes the stiffness matrix. Notice how each element of this matrix has a similar form as isotropic case, but it uses a specific value of Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Swapping the values can result in a totally different material, 
which is why it's very important to understand the material constants. Also, if we set the material properties equal in all the directions, it reduces to the isotropic case discussed earlier. 